you ever dreamed of exploring another world? Could you witness something new? Push boundaries? Or reach for your greatest hope? The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. December 1925, a private home in Manhattan Beach, New York. The front doorbell rang, and I ran to the door. I was five years old. And there standing in the doorway were two bulky guys, both wearing fedora hats and black overcoats, but very aggressive looking. Hey, Sonny, your father home? He's in his office. The men stride into where New York defense attorney Sam Leibowitz is sitting. One is Big Al Capone, and the other is his sidekick, Frank Nitti. They have only one question for Leibowitz. Counselor, we're in trouble. Can you help us out? Hello, I'm defense attorney Bruce Cutler. The U.S. Constitution promises that all defendants who sit here are presumed innocent, and someone has to take their side. Defense attorneys, often considered just as wicked as our most notorious clients, why would anyone undertake such a thankless job? Money? Power? Prestige? New York attorney Sam Leibowitz did it because he believed he had greatness in him. From 1919 to 1940, he represented some of history's most infamous underworld figures and its most oppressed citizens. December 1925, Al Capone and Frank Nitti have come to defense attorney Sam Leibowitz's door because they are in trouble. The trouble is a charge of murder. Capone, on vacation from Chicago, has managed to make a few enemies in the Brooklyn dockyards. He ends up in a gin mill on Christmas night with a bunch of Italian-American and Irish-American gangsters. It was unclear exactly what happened and what triggered it, but a big brouhaha breaks out, shots ring out, and when the smoke cleared, three Irish-American gangsters are dead. Al Capone and everybody else who's in the joint at the time uh, are suspects. I recall my father saying to these Two men at the dining room table. I was lurking in the background. Mr. Leibowitz, take our case. You have such a fine record. We've had you scouted out. My father said, well, I'll look into it. I can't guarantee you anything, but I'll do my best to get you off. They've heard of the famous attorney from Brooklyn. They've heard of his magic. He was reputed to be the best criminal defense trial lawyer in the country. He pulled a lot of rabbits out of a lot of hats. I don't think we've seen anybody any better. He had a nationwide reputation, and deservedly so. He was good. But is he good enough to get a big-time trophy collar like Alphonse Capone out of the clutches of the New York police? It was a tug-of-war between the cops who were trying to keep the suspects, including Al Capone, in jail, and Leibowitz, who was trying to get him out. Leibowitz basically was able to function as a rainmaker, make the case go away before it came to trial. He went and got a statement from the guy who had been shot and been wounded, basically saying that none of the people were there, and he ended up getting everybody out of jail, and the case just went away. Al Capone never forgot that, because every Christmas, we used to get a plum cake or a fruit cake inscribed from your pal Al. Samuel Leibowitz never expected to rub elbows with the biggest bad men in America. His family arrived in New York from Romania in 1897, and he grows up on Manhattan's teeming Lower East Side. He is a bright yet unexceptional student, but by high school graduation, he knows what he wants to do for a living. He wanted to become a civil engineer, but my grandfather said, no, if you're gonna be a professional man, you gotta be a lawyer. 
Sam enters Cornell University Law School in 1911 and excels at law. But he finds his true voice in the theater. He was the first Jew to become part of the theater group. And he honed the skills that he had developed in high school uh, for performing. And he used to pose in front of a mirror at Cornell and go through the gestures and the motions and tone of voice. And he found out that he was a very convincing debater. When it came time for my father to graduate in 1915, my father said to the dean, look, for an unconnected prospective attorney such as myself, what would you think about going into the criminal law? And the dean said, oh, no, Sam, anything but that. And at that time, uh, the major Wall Street firms were closed uh, to Jews. And Leibowitz was a very ambitious man, and he thought the only way he could do it was on his own and as a criminal defense lawyer. Looking to pick up some real-world experience, Leibowitz begins hanging around the Brooklyn courthouse in 1917, looking for work. His first case is hardly promising. Harry Patterson, a local drunk, who has been indicted for using a skeleton key to break into a Brooklyn tavern and steal $7 and a bottle of booze. When the cops finally found him, the liquor was gone, the $7 was gone. All he had was a key. Everybody expected Leibowitz would plead him guilty. He didn't. But what's the defense? Leibowitz stood up and asked for a visitation of the scene to go to the bar with the key to see if the key would work. And he asked the district attorney, have you ever investigated the fact whether this key fits the door of the premises? And the district attorney hadn't. And the prosecutor, recognizing that this case, which was way overblown, ought to end and end quickly, uh, declined that invitation and rested. That gave Leibowitz the opportunity to argue to the jury reasonable doubt. And the jury agrees. Harry Patterson walks free. After the case was over, they took the key and walked out, and it would open virtually any door in the courthouse, as it probably would have opened the saloon door. That case began to make Leibowitz's name. The creativity the imagination he brought to his defenses, if you read the records of some of the cases, it's startling. A guy at that time would come up with some of the things that he did. In particular, the resources he brought into play in the uh, Harry Huffman case, which was uh, a case where the circumstances were so incredibly incriminating. When Sam Leibowitz first hears from Harry Huffman in 1929, Huffman is Sing Sing prisoner number 57790 convicted of the horrific murder of a young woman. In 1924, a young Staten Island mom, Maud Bauer, was driving along with her mom and her daughter uh, when her car stalled. Uh, she left the, her mom and daughter in the car and tried to go get help from a passing motorist. She disappeared. Sometime later, was found shot to death. Her body was found in a nearby field. She'd been shot in the head and in the neck and the body. The witnesses at the time told police that they had seen a short, uh, stocky guy wearing horn rim glasses and a hat leaving the scene. This fit the description to a T of Harry Hoffman. Hoffman also owns a Ford car like the one spotted leaving the scene and a 25 caliber handgun, just like the gun that was used to kill Maud Bauer. The web that was spun around him included a letter that he had written to his brother, together with the, a 25 caliber pistol, in which he enclosed a note wherein he tells his brother, if I am arrested in connection with, this, with the case, that he should get rid of the gun. The jury got the case late one night, the next morning, he was guilty, sentenced to 20 years in prison, and at that point, he thought he was gone forever. Hoffman wins an appeal based on faulty trial procedures. But in 1929, when he's ready for court again, his lawyer suddenly dies. It seemed to be a hopeless case. And he finally wrote to my father, please, I'm innocent, will you take my case? But that's the most common plaint in the world. Criminals, you know, convicts protesting their innocence. But for some reason, it piqued Sam's curiosity. And nobody to this day knows why Sam took the case. 
But you wouldn't think much of the stranger if he refused to lend his skilled hand to the patient on the operating table simply because there was a possibility, or even a likelihood, of the patient dying. Even for a man who loves challenges, this might be too much. It's going to take a miracle to free convicted killer Harry Hoffman. Defense attorney Sam Leibowitz's great challenge of 1929 is not simply a trial, but a retrial. A new day in court for Harry Hoffman, who has already been found guilty of brutally murdering a young mother. In May of 1929, the curtain opens on the Hoffman retrial. Without hesitation, Leibowitz moves in to attack the state's evidence. The ballistics experts at the first trial testified that the shell casings found at the scene came from the pistol which he had sent to his brother. He mustered his own array of ballistics experts, and they contradicted the prosecution ballistics witnesses. He had a comparison microscope brought in front of the jury box, got the court's permission to allow the jurors to look into the microscope and see the disparity between the two slugs. They persuaded the jury that, in fact, the gun that he had sent to his brother with that very ominous note uh, was not the gun that killed the victim. With equal ease, Leibowitz takes care of the eyewitness testimony. One of the witnesses had sworn under oath that he had seen a Ford car driving suspiciously away not far from where she'd been found. My father had gone out there at the same time of day, same time of the year, and found out that the sun at that particular time was glinting off these vertical windshields that the old cars used to have. And nobody could have identified anyone driving along that road. He was able to refute the eyewitnesses in front of the jury to the point of almost evisceration. That was an amazing feat in and of itself, the way he disposed of the eyewitnesses. And his summation, of course, was the theatrical, the dramatic, you know, he made some kind of a comment that I don't think you can find a dog guilty uh, of the crime based on this evidence. The jury returns the stunning verdict, not guilty. One of the most spectacular acquittals, I think, in recorded history, Harry Hoffman walked, and I'm still not convinced the guy was innocent. <laughs> One of Leibowitz's firmest rules of lawyering is never to socialize with his clients. But when his notorious client, Al Capone, calls in 1931, demanding a sit-down with his mouthpiece, Leibowitz takes the first train to Chicago. Scarface Al has been indicted for federal tax evasion, and he is hopping mad. Capone was already ensconced as the crime boss of the USA, and the president himself uh, directed all the energies of the federal government to, to, to nail him on this tax count. Al been paying off officials and the cops in Chicago, and he felt he had a right to get away with everything because he was paying them off. And he wanted to fight the case on grounds that he was double-crossed. Capone drove my father around in his armor-plated Cadillac. And they went to Cicero, which Capone controlled as a, an adjunct of Chicago. And they had Italian food. Leibowitz looked at the evidence, looked at the case, and basically said, Al, I think you're dead meat here. It's time for you to plead guilty. Take a plea. Tell them everything you know. Tell them you were paying off guys. And throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Capone refused. He said, if I plead guilty, I'll have to reveal the sources and my connections, and I'd be a dead pigeon. My gang rivals would kill me. Leibowitz was not going to let Al Capone dictate how the case was going to fly. He said, if you're not going to listen to me, uh, you, know, you can't take the case. Sam refused to represent him. I suspect that he felt that was a ship that had already sunk and he was not going to get aboard. But Leibowitz returns home to a nasty surprise. Even the brilliant Sam Leibowitz is vulnerable to the kind of accusation that can sully the record of any great defender. Leibowitz, like a lot of defense counsel, uh, got into, quote, trouble. Uh, he defended some of the police who were accused of malfeasance at the time of the, the famous uh, Seabury investigation. 
The Seabury investigation was launched by New York Governor Franklin Roosevelt in 1931 to investigate claims of corruption among vice cops in New York City. Five of the accused cops hired Leibowitz to handle their case before a departmental hearing. He was representing certain police officers who were involved with a, in a conspiracy with certain uh, prostitutes and procurers, pimps, <laughs> one in particular, Chile Acuna. Chile claims he was a police informant who has become mixed up in an extortion ring run by the cops. He claims that he helped the crooked cops shake down hookers for cash. Then he gets a piece of the tape. Leibowitz tells the police court a different version. Chile is no informant, argues Leibowitz. He's just a pimp, and he can't be trusted. Leibowitz found a hooker who had worked for Acuna named Ava. Sam puts Ava on the stand. Yeah, I know that pimp. Well, I was in the house on 65th Street. He brought men there to meet me. You're a prostitute? Yes. He got her to testify that Acuna while he was her pimp and she was a hooker, was unreliable, was a liar, was a lowlife. Chile's lie is exposed and his credibility as a witness shot. Humiliated, he leaves the courtroom, vowing revenge on Sam Leibowitz. Soon after, all of Leibowitz's cop clients are found innocent of the charges. Shortly thereafter, Acuna and Ava got back together and they went to the DA's office and told the DA that in fact, the cops were taking graft and that Leibowitz got her to make up the story that she told. The DA had lost a lot of cases to Leibowitz and was looking to make a case. In the fall of 1931, the crisis reaches its peak. On September 29th, District Attorney William Geegan indicts Sam Leibowitz for subordination of perjury. My father was devastated when when the indictment was charged, he was taken down and booked as a common criminal. When he came home that night with the fingerprint ink on his fingers. For the consummate defender, it is the ultimate humiliation. It's one of the institutional hazards that prosecutors who lose sometimes take their losses uh, personal, and they use the machinery of criminal justice to move against defenders. One of the most brilliant legal careers since Clarence Darrow hangs in the balance. The trial court thought that the charge was inadequately corroborated. It was appealed. The appellate court reinstated it, but the Brooklyn District Attorney never prosecuted it. Subsequent to the indictment, Chile Acuna uh, died of uh, some sort of head ailment or some, some, some head injury, and uh, the case folded. The DA got his glory, got his name in the newspaper as having indicted the great Sam Leibowitz, and then uh, rather than take the case to trial, just dismissed the case sometime shortly thereafter. That was a very, very narrow escape for Sam. What Leibowitz needs now is a case to get him back on his feet and back in the headlines as a top mouthpiece. In December 1931, one of New York City's most cold-blooded killers gives Leibowitz his shot at a comeback. In 1931, New York defense attorney Sam Leibowitz needs a big victory. His brilliant reputation is in danger of being swept away by his indictment on charges that he suborned perjury from a witness. Then, in the nick of time, bullets fly in Harlem on July 28th. A car pulled along 107th Street and toward 3rd Avenue, it slowed. Two windows were rolled down on the car. Two men put out Tommy guns and fired away an attempted gangland rub out. Instead of hitting the intended target, they wounded five kids seriously and killed one in his baby carriage. The murder scene is in the territory of a vicious mobster named Vincent Mad Dog Cole. Word spreads that Cole and his men sprayed the street with gunfire in an attempt to wipe out a rival. The police go looking for Mad Dog. Two months later, he was picked up and charged with the crime. He had changed his appearance, dyed his hair. People suspected that he was in the car and responsible for the killing. Once arrested and charged, uh, Mad Dog Cole went for Sam Leibowitz. 
the public is screaming for a conviction in the little boy's killing. And the prosecution has dug up a mysterious witness named George Breck. He was a low-level hooligan uh, who said he had been walking along the street when he saw the car going by, bullets firing, and had seen Cole actually doing the shooting. In a Manhattan courtroom in December 1931, Leibowitz grills Breck for two days. Something about the witness doesn't sit right with Sam, so he sets out a few snares to try and catch Breck off guard. So he asked Breck, have you ever been a witness in a case before? Breck said, no, never. Have you ever been convicted of any crime? Breck said, no. After he left the stand, Leibowitz caught a break. Breck had come from St. Louis. He had testified previously in St. Louis uh, in another case and had been paid by the police. Leibowitz found this out from a court clerk who also coincidentally had been from St. Louis and had known about Breck's testimony. Armed with the clerk's information, Leibowitz begins a fresh attack on Breck. Breck went back on the stand and he finally had a breakdown and admit that he testified falsely for the police and been paid for it. Many a cause for either side, the state and the defense, has been ruined by the unfortunate display of a witness on the stand who cannot stand up as to his credibility. A situation, by the way, that's akin to a chap promenading on his fine new holiday suit, but with a nasty soup stain right on the lapel of his garment. The prosecution can produce no other evidence. The judge instructs the jury to acquit Mad Dog Cole. It's another breathtaking victory, thanks to Leibowitz's surgical destruction of a witness, a technique he himself describes as an essential part of his arsenal. Six weeks later, Mad Dog Cole is making a phone call in a uh, drugstore on 8th Avenue and 23rd Street. Guy walks in with a violin case. Cuts him right in half. Cole is retired, and Leibowitz has restored his own reputation as a genius in the well of the court. He is the best trial lawyer in the country. His record was 78 trials, and he hadn't lost a case. 77 acquittals and one hung jury. I don't know of any trial lawyer in the 20th century or even earlier that had a record like that. But on the afternoon of March 25, 1931, a brawl on a freight train in Alabama will put that record to the test and forever changed New York defense attorney, Sam Leibowitz. The Scottsboro boys were uh, nine young black men who were riding on a train. There were some white men there and there were two white girls. The black men got into a fight with the white men and threw them off the train. The white girls remained on the train. When the five or six whites got off the train, they went to the nearest town and told the police authorities there that these blacks had created mayhem on the freight train. When they got to the next station, uh, the whites had uh, arranged to have the train stop, and the blacks were taken off. And then they were accused of the rape of the two white women. They were convicted within a few days of their arrest uh, in a mob atmosphere. The attorney picked to defend these defendants, he didn't represent them properly because he was afraid of his own life. But every time one of the guilty verdicts was announced, cheers went up, there were bands playing, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. And it became a cause celeb that two white women whose testimony was basically uncorroborated could testify against the black men and nine men and be sentenced to death. That particular conviction and the death sentences which followed for eight of the nine were reversed by the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules that the defendants were denied the proper right to counsel and orders new trials. The young men need a new lawyer, a good one. We have justice and a great deal of public opinion on our side. I will fight to my last breath to send these boys back to their parents and to their loved ones. Sam Leibowitz had built his record representing organized crime figures. Here was an opportunity for him to represent disadvantaged black youths that he felt 
had been railroaded. So it was an opportunity for him to gain prominence on a national stage and to do it for a good cause, for the cause of justice. If the Scottsboro case is a cause celeb when Leibowitz signs up, his arrival in Decatur, Alabama in March of 1933 turns it into a circus. The Ku Klux Klan publicly declares its intention to kill Leibowitz. Samuel Leibowitz walks to the court with two former New York cops as bodyguard. He was a northerner. That was not a plus. He was Jewish. That certainly was not a plus. He was endangering his own life and uh, of more importance, his wife's life, who demanded that she go with him. When I was down in Alabama with my mother and my father, I was in the next room at a hotel where they were staying and two little black boys came up and they played the banjo or the fiddle and they sang for the people in the room. And just as entertainers, and then when they left, you know, everybody gave them a little money. When they left, some white people downstairs shot them to death in front of the hotel. And I remember my mother was just devastated by that. The trial of the first Scottsboro defendant, Haywood Patterson, begins in Decatur, Alabama on March 27, 1933. Leibowitz wants to challenge the prosecution's version of the crime scene. Unfortunately, the crime scene is a freight train, and Leibowitz can't bring that into the well of the court. He went to the Lionel Company, had these replica trains made of the freight train in which the Scottsboro boys were on. Using the toy trains, Leibowitz demonstrates that any witnesses were likely too far away to have seen anything. Then he moves on to the true heart of the case, the women who accused the men of rape, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates. In a shocking reversal, Ruby Bates takes the stand for the defense and dramatically recants her accusation. You testified in Scottsboro that you were raped by six Negroes. Who coached you to say that? She told it and I told it just like she did. The case itself included testimony by a courageous doctor uh, that there was no corroboration in an examination of the woman of any violent penetration. So the physical corroboration was not there. That leaves Victoria Price's claim as the only evidence of rape. That one there grabbed my legs and pulled them apart. And one of them climbed on top. Closing arguments are made on April 8, 1933. Prosecutor Wade Wright tells the jury, Alabama justice cannot be bought and sold with Jew money from New York. At 10 p.m. on the second day of deliberations, the all-white male jury returns the verdict written in pencil on a scrap of paper. We find the defendant guilty and fix the penalty at death in the electric chair. In a sense, he had a New York City attitude. What would work in New York City would work anywhere. He had no appreciation for the levels of prejudice that he would face. Exhausted and bitter, Sam Leibowitz returns to New York, where he tells reporters that Southerners are lantern-jawed creatures, bigots whose mouths are slits in their faces, dripping tobacco juice, bewhiskered and filthy. Very insulting to the South, very insulting at a time when he still had other Scottsboro black defendants to represent. Not a good move for a trial lawyer. That was my father. He spit it out. He never held anything back. What was in his heart was on his lips. And yet, two months after the verdict, Judge James Horton throws out the guilty decision. It was simply the testimony of Victoria Price against the young black man. That was supposed to be enough to convict. Uh, and as the judge analyzed it, it was not enough, which is a courageous thing for a judge to have done. Leibowitz is going to get another crack at fighting for the Scottsboro defendants. This time, he has a secret weapon, one that can not only save the defendants' lives, but change the American courtroom forever. In April 1933, an Alabama jury hands defense attorney Sam Leibowitz a crushing defeat, a guilty verdict and death penalty in the case of the Scottsboro boys. Soon after, throws out that verdict. So Leibowitz has a new strategy, 
one he hopes will undermine any guilty verdict. Leibowitz's clients, nine young black men, have been accused of raping two white women on an Alabama freight train. But Leibowitz doesn't base his new strategy on the details of the case. Instead, he argues that his clients cannot possibly receive a trial by their peers because no court in Alabama ever chooses blacks to be on juries. And that makes the trial itself unconstitutional. He produced scores upon scores of black citizens lawyers, doctors, shopkeepers, every conceivable category that ordinarily, if they hadn't been black, would have made them very desirable jurors. This move for dismissal fails, but Leibowitz's ploy has laid the foundation for a sensational appeal if he loses the trial itself. On November 27th, the trial of the next Scottsboro defendant, Clarence Norris, begins. The new trial judge, William Callahan, is hostile to Leibowitz, overruling his objections and dismissing his motions. Worst of all, Leibowitz's star witness, Ruby Bates, is frightened for her life, and she refuses to appear in the courtroom to repeat her testimony that the rape claims were false. Over the next three days, Haywood Patterson is tried again. Mr. Patterson? Down here, Mr. Leibowitz, we call them by their first name. <laughs> Tell us, Haywood, exactly what happened on the train. Well, we were minding our own business when one of them said, This is a white man train. All you nigga bastards unload. In conclusion, I say to you, if you turn this nigga loose, it won't be safe for your wives, your girlfriends, or your daughters to walk the streets anywhere in the South. Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Leibowitz. Argumentative. That's enough. I've said nothing wrong. Your Honor knows. I always use this line at the conclusion of these nigger rape cases. The verdicts. Guilty. In December of 1933, Clarence Norris and Haywood Patterson are sentenced to death. It looks like a tremendous defeat. But now Leibowitz can unleash the appeal he has prepared because of the absence of black jurors. Leibowitz fights the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And in his hands is the proof that blacks have been systematically excluded. He accused Alabama of tampering with the jury rolls. One of the justices said, can you prove that? And at that point, Sam produced the jury rolls themselves, the pages, and handed them to the United States Supreme Court. The jury rolls had been tampered with in an attempt to show that blacks were not excluded from being on the juries. Those that administered the jury rolls in Alabama inserted a number of black names. They had to insert those names back in 1931, so they had to squeeze them into the pages and it was an obvious forgery. And that resulted in another reversal of the convictions of the Scottsboro Boys. It was Samuel Leibowitz's greatest triumph, a victory with sweeping impact nationwide. What Sam Leibowitz did was actually change the patterns of criminal justice in the South forever. Black people now could be on juries. When blacks were being charged, they would have their black peers on juries making decisions for them. Alabama refuses to give in. The Scottsboro trials and retrials grind on. In the end, the state of Alabama goes through eight separate trials. But the tide is turning in the defense's favor. Leibowitz has fought Alabama justice to a standstill. On July 22, 1937, Alabama drops rape charges against four of the nine and releases them into Leibowitz's custody. Four others are convicted but paroled by the mid-1940s. Hayward Patterson, the first to be defended by Leibowitz, remains in prison until 1948 when he escapes and flees to Michigan. For the first time since abolition, blacks and whites work together in defense of the Scottsboro Boys. It was in a sense a coalition that served us very well during the civil rights movement in the 60s and in the 70s.
Now that his schedule finally allows, Leibowitz escapes for one of his favorite diversions, a trip to Europe with his family. Leibowitz is only 45 when he returns to New York in 1938. Almost certainly, he's the best known criminal defender in America. But he has had enough of arguing cases. Leibowitz has an eye on the judge's bench. In 1939, Lepke Bokhalter, the head of a Jewish gang of criminals based in Brooklyn, you know, sometimes known as Murder Inc., was charged with narcotics trafficking. Two accomplices of Louis Lepke came up to our house in Manhattan Beach, and my father was sitting at his desk in the library, and they had a satchel with them. Mr. Lepke told me to give this to you as a token of his appreciation if you would take his case. They dumped $100,000 in cash on my father's desk. My father said, gentlemen, take the money back. I'm not gonna touch your case with a 10-foot pole. He turned it down because he felt that if he took this case, he would never get on the bench because this gangster was a notorious gangster and the publicity would destroy his chances and he was up for consideration right at that time for appointment. I think he had had enough of criminal law. It's a very debilitating process. It's physically exhausting, mentally exhausting. There's tremendous emotion all the time, and I think he was drained. I want to quit at the peak, he said. I don't want to go into decline like some overage ball player. In the general election of November 1940, Sam Leibowitz is overwhelmingly elected to a 14-year term as a criminal court judge. There are conservative voices who have fought against Leibowitz's election. Put this legendary defender of criminals on the bench, they warn and Leibowitz will set free every criminal in New York. Sam Leibowitz ascends the bench of the Brooklyn Criminal Courts in January 1941. In presenting him with his first official gavel, presiding judge Franklin Taylor declares, you have been Samuel Leibowitz, the great lawyer. You will be Samuel Leibowitz, the great judge. He had defended over many years, many notorious criminals. But when he became a judge, it seemed things switched. He became notorious as more or less a hanging judge. His comment was, is he learned from dealing with people like Al Capone, that with snakes, you either defang them or kill them or put them where they can't bite anymore. Judge Leibowitz becomes known for his sentencing sessions, in which he displays a wicked and sometimes cruel wit. I remember one particular case, this very old guy saying something to the effect that he couldn't take a heavy sentence because he was too old. And Sam said, all right, just, just do the best you can. And he gave him 65 years. The elected term of a criminal court judge is 14 years. But within the first year or two, Leibowitz has already made his reputation as one of the toughest judges ever to wear the robes of office. I remember a young man uh, stood before him to be sentenced. And the good judge said to him, he says, you see out that window? You see that tree out there? The man says, oh, yes, I see a big tree out there. The judge says, no, no, not the big tree. The little bitty tree near the big tree. Well, let me tell you something. When you get out of jail, that little bitty tree is going to be much bigger than that big tree that you're looking at now. And there was an occasion when I had to go into his chambers to get some subpoenas signed. A young boy was sitting in, on the couch, and uh, Judge Leibowitz turned to the young boy and said, this is one of the lawyers, Sonny, who attempts to free these people who are accused of crimes, but don't you worry about it, because Grandpa's not going to let him do that. Everybody hated him. Nobody wanted to work with him, certainly not the defense lawyers. And I, stupid as I was, I wanted to work there. He was the world's authority on how to convince 12 people of the righteousness of your cause. That's what he was really good at. He made a trial lawyer out of me. He was a dominant figure in the courtroom when he was a trial lawyer, and that's something he couldn't get over. That's something he couldn't put aside when he became a judge. He wanted to run the courtroom. He wanted to ask the questions. That's not the role of a judge in our system. My father would take over the questioning of these attorneys, which he had a right to do, and steering the questions in a different direction, which 
some of them didn't like. I have a distinct recollection of him berating jurors after a verdict in a murder case. And uh, I, I could not believe the, the outburst where, wherein I remember his yelling at them and the bailiff, get them out, get them out, and I hope he's waiting for you when you get home. Now, in the old days that you're talking about, you didn't have the media of communication, you didn't have the broadcasting of these scandals, and on top of that, you had the mores of the community. He used to say to me, I can't sit on this bench and watch incompetence in front of me. I wish that twice a year I could get off the bench and once I could prosecute a case and once I could defend a case. That's what I'd like to do. Oddly enough, you find that some of the worst judges were some of the most energetic defense lawyers, like Judge Leibowitz, and some of the best judges are former prosecutors. But some see a more complex Judge Leibowitz than his courtroom persona might suggest. He was a very tender man. People didn't think so because he was a bit bombastic. I remember one time when he was a judge, the defendant had been convicted and sentenced to death. He thought that the ruling by the jury was unfair. And I remember him spending days on the telephone trying to get his governor of New York to commute the sentence. And the night this man was executed, my father just broke, he cried and he, he was just devastated. Sam Leibowitz was extremely popular with the public because the perception of the public was that Sam Leibowitz was cleaning the streets of the criminals. He was the darling of the press. Leibowitz is also a social man. His passion for baseball leads him to Ebbets Field so often that the Brooklyn Dodgers name him their official number one fan. He was an ardent baseball fan and I had played minor league baseball in the Brooklyn Dodger farm system, so we had something really to talk about and enjoy together. His parties are attended by luminaries, from movie stars to the mayor of New York City. He was a very sociable man. We had people in the house all the time, playwrights, politicians, actors, actresses. Frank Sinatra was a frequent visitor to our house. I cannot tell you how exciting those days were. In spite of his tantrums and the terror he inspires in defense attorneys, Sam Leibowitz is re-elected to a second term in 1954. Judges in those days, uh, but lamentably as far as I'm concerned today, ruled, really ruled the roost. No one in the 50s would ever think of questioning that. There was no committees to complain to at that time. By the 1960s, three generations of young lawyers have come of age under Sam Leibowitz's frowning supervision. He has become a towering figure in the New York courts. When his term was at an end, the Association of the Bar in New York City asked that he not be continuing. And they objected to him precisely on his lack of judicial temperament. The board, in fact, extended it, but I think history has to write that Leibowitz was a stronger defense lawyer than he was a judge. Sam Leibowitz retires in 1970. Eight years later, he dies at the age of 84. Today, a professorship in trial practices at the Cornell University Law School is endowed in his name. I don't think he could have prevailed today. I don't think his M.O., the, 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 the injudicious remarks that he would make, he couldn't have gotten away with them in today's world. I can understand why so many people misread him. He was an actor. He enchanted the jury, he enchanted the audience. He took over. When he walked into a room, you knew he was there. There were two Sam Leibowitzes. The Sam Leibowitz, who was a great criminal defense lawyer, and then the reformer Sam Leibowitz, who became a judge and tried to make up for every sin that he believed he had committed during his lifetime. Sam Leibowitz was a master of trial technique. He served as a mouthpiece for Al Capone and Mad Dog Cole. And in the Scottsboro case, he took on hatred itself. Leibowitz was capable of great compassion, as well as vindictive cruelty. Perhaps he had no patience for his own ploys and stratagems when he saw them practiced in his own courtroom. What is the legacy of Samuel? 
That depends very much on whom you ask. I'm Bruce Cutler telling you that when it comes to the law, there's controversy on both sides of the bench. Ring, ding, tingling, true. Come on, it's 
the birds of a feather would be. Let's take that road before us and sing a chorus or two. Come on, it's lovely when the chorus lay right together with you. There's a birthday party at the home of Farmer Gray. It'll be the perfect ending of a perfect day. We'll be singing the songs we love to sing without a single stop. At the fireplace while we watch the chestnuts pop. Pop, pop, pop. There's a happy feeling nothing in the world can buy. When they pass around the coffee and the pumpkin pie. It'll nearly be like a picture print by Courier and Nice. These wonderful things are the things we remember all through our lives. Just hear those sleigh bells tingling, ring, ting, tingling too. Come on, it's lovely when the forest sleigh ride right together with you. Outside the snow is falling and friends are calling you. Come on, it's lovely when the forest sleigh ride right together with you. Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, let's go. Let's look at the show. We're riding in the wonderland of snow. or thoughts devotional whatever happens or what may be here is what Christmas time means to me city sidewalks busy sidewalks dressed in holiday style in the Feeling of Christmas Children laughing, people passing Meeting smile after smile And on every street corner you Silver bells, silver bells
Put up the tree before my spirit falls again. Fill up the stocking. I may be rushing things, but deck the halls again now. For we need a little Christmas right this very minute. Candles in the window, carols at the spirit. Yes, we need a little Christmas right this it hasn't snowed a single flurry, but Santa dear, we're in a hurry, so climb down the chimney, put up the brightest string of lights I've ever seen, slice up the fruitcake, it's time we hung some tinsel on that evergreen bough. For I've grown a little leaner, grown a little colder, grown a little sadder, grown a little Need a little Christmas now. Hold out the holly. Haven't I taught you well to live each living day? Fill up the stocking. My daddy made it's one week past Thanksgiving Day now. But we need a little Christmas right this very minute. Candles in the window. Candles at the stairs. Climb down the chimney. It's been a long time since I got good neighbor to slice up the fruit cake. It's time we hung some tinsel on the bed.